and amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. have a Bible, there's a Bible in the back around the corner under the table. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. This is the story about the King Asa, his response to the Lord, what the Lord did for the nation of Judah and Benjamin and a few other nations who tagged along. And the title is a play on words this morning. The Lord uh, gave me a question that he asked me on Tuesday of this week, is this not that? Is this that we are experiencing here in these days, all the stuff that we see happening in our country, all the negativity, all the rioting, all the looting, all the upset, all the stuff that is going on, is this that we see not that that we see right in the Word? Okay? So is this not that? In verse 1, I'll not read the whole text, but I'll read quite a bit of it. It says, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet King Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. In other words, you're going to experience God. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without a true God. He's referring, the prophet is referring back to the period of Judges. A long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But even in those days when they were in trouble, when Israel was in trouble, they did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought Him, and He was found of them. He granted them mercy. And in those times when they forsaken God, there was no peace to Him that went out, nor to Him that came in. No peace. To those who went out and to those who came in. But great disruptions, great disturbances, King James uses the word vexations, it's a good word, were upon all the inhabitants of the countries, and nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city. For God did trouble them with all adversity. Be ye strong therefore, Asa, and let not your hands be weak and lazy, for your work, the things that God calls you to do, shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of the prophet, he took courage and he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and restored the altar of the Lord and was before the portico of the Lord at the house of God. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon, and they, they that fell to him out of the country in abundance when they saw that the Lord God was with Asa. Verse 12. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, God of their fathers, with all their heart and with all their soul. Verse 15. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart no half-hearted Christianity here, people. They swore with all their heart and sought Him with their whole desire. And God was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. Verse 19. And there was no more war unto the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Now, we are celebrating 244 years today as a nation. We're getting to be where we're pretty old. Amen. We ought to know better than doing a lot of the things that we're doing. But we're 244 years old. That's what we are celebrating. And what a difference a year makes. Can you remember last year this time? 
Our leaders and others were telling us how great everything was. We've got the greatest economy in the world. We've got the most robust economy you've ever seen. We've got the lowest unemployment figures that's ever been in the history of our nation for all people groups. There is the greatest amount of opportunity for people in America that has ever been. Oh, do you remember that? <laughs> All of these wonderful things that were happening in, in America and all, you know, how good everything was. And along with our leaders and others telling us how great it was, they were giving God the credit for it, wasn't they? They were giving God the glory for it, wasn't they? They were not. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has warned us. He has warned us over and over and over in His Word. If you build your house, if you build your fortunes on the shifting sands of human ingenuity and human accomplishments, oh, listen, the floods of pandemic, the floods, floods of social uh, issues and evils and the like can come and almost overnight wash everything away and great will be the fall of it. So says Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's gone. Just like that, it's gone. I want to ask you a question. What do the people of God do when we have such reversal of fortunes? <laughs> what do we do when all of these blessings seems to just dry up and pass away almost overnight? Is there any word from the Lord about this? Is there any word from the Lord God from the scriptures about what's going on in our society and in our land? Huh? Any word? Has God got anything to say about this? As a matter of fact, he does. I read over this text about three or four weeks ago in my regular reading, and the Lord said these words are going to have an out very soon. And this morning's the time for them to have their out, okay? And as I read over this on Tuesday, the Lord asked me this question. Is this not that? Is what we are seeing in our country right now all of these problems, all of these issues, all of this trouble, all of this adversity, is this that's going on in our country, not that that we see in the Scripture, especially verses 3 through 6. You say, I don't know, Pastor. Well, let's take a look and see, okay? Let's just move right through this text and see what the Lord has to say to His people this morning. First, I want you to see what I'm going to call the word of the prophets. In verse 1, he said, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and he said unto him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Verse 7. Be ye strong, therefore. Don't be lazy. Don't let your hands be weak. For the work, for your work that the Lord gives you to do shall be rewarded. Now the context is one in which Asa was a good king. He was a spiritual man. He was a man of prayer. And he had had and brought about many spiritual reforms in chapter 14. He had brought some good things to, to the uh, people of Judah. And many of the people in the northern kingdom, when they saw how that God was blessing him, they came and joined him in the southern kingdom. Everybody wants to go to Florida. Amen. That's it. They want to go to Florida. But then something happened. A massive army from the south of Judah came against Judah and King Asa. They were so outmatched, it's not even funny. On paper... There's no use to even fire a rocket or sling a rock or throw a sword or spear or anything. They might as well have given up. But Asa, being the man of God that he was, did not give up or give in. He did not cower down. But it says that Asa went to the Lord in prayer. 
And he cried out to the Lord. And he says, Lord, we're going to trust you on this. Here's a man who's getting ready to go to the war. And you know what he says? He says, we're going to rest in you. Rest and war don't go together. <laughs> that lets you understand what kind of man of faith he was. He believed God would deliver them. He was trusting in God. He said, we're going to rest in you. And we're going to trust in your great and mighty name, O God. And in verse 12 it says, So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa. Verse 13, And the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before the Lord's host. Hallelujah. God delivered them from this massive, massive army from the south, 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And it was on the heels of that great victory in Asa and Judah's life that God raised up this prophet to go see Asa after he had this great victory to tell him, now honey, you don't need to get too cocky. You don't need to put your big britches on and think you did all this yourself. Amen. That's right. And this is what he said to him. The prophet reminded Asa that this victory and this blessing was God's doing, not yours. You didn't bring this about. And then he said this to him. The prophet reminded Asa that the Lord was with him. It was the Lord who brought about this victory. It was the Lord who gave Judah the victory over this massive army. And he reminded him that the Lord was with him as long as Asa in Judah was with the Lord. And if you seek the Lord, you will be found by Him. In other words, God will come into your camp, into your midst, and you will experience the blessing and the victory of God. It was God who did this, Asa. It's not your doing. The battle's not mine, it's the Lord's. It was God who did this in your life because you were abiding, yielding, and obeying Him. Because you were walking in righteousness. You were walking in truth. And you called upon God and God delivered you. Now let's not get cocky. Let's not get, become proud and think you did this. It was God who did this in your life. And then He gives this warning. If you forsake God, God will forsake you. Oh my goodness. When he was on top of the mountain, when he was enjoying a great victory, this is what the Lord said to him. Have you heard this message lately? Is this not the same thing that the Lord has been saying to us lately about abiding, yielding, and obeying? The Lord is with us if we are with him. We can pursue the Lord and seek Him and we will be found by Him if we are abiding, yielding, and obeying Him. This is John 15, 5 in the Old Testament. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in Him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Look at the much fruit in Asa's life and the nation's life when they walked with the Lord in righteousness. God bless them. They were outnumbered. It's pitiful. And yet they walked away with a victory. Why? Because God brought about the victory. Amen. Since we're on a national stage, I think that we need to ask ourselves this question. Is America forsaking God? Yes. Have we turned our back on the Lord as a nation? I'm not talking about maybe just you, but look at us as a nation. What does it mean when we remove the Ten Commandments in prayer from public school. That's that little sign that Bill Green gave me about the Ten Commandments there. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's hanging on a fence post in Tennessee. As people drive up and down the road, they can see it. What does it mean when we as a nation have removed the Ten Commandments in prayer from our public schools? When we have said we don't need this anymore. Our children don't need a moral code. They don't. <laughs> you could have fooled me. <laughs> what does it mean? It means we've turned our back on God. You say, well, I didn't do it, but our representatives did. Our judicial branch did. 
Our Supreme Court justices did, and they speak for the nation. They're the highest court in the land. Not all of them voted for it, but enough of them voted for it to turn the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, off the walls of our schools and said, we don't need to be praying anymore before we start our day publicly. What does it mean when we make it legal to kill a baby in a mother's womb? When God's word protects the innocent child in the mother's womb. When God says in his word that he knew, knows us in the womb. What does it mean? It means that we've turned our back on God. That's what it means. And again, the same Supreme Court did the same thing again. The majority of them. What does it mean when we redefine God's design for marriage? The Bible says Adam and Eve. But the Supreme Court says it can be Adam and Steve. Amen. What does that mean when we do stuff like that? And we don't voice our uh, disapproval. It means that we've turned our back on God. That's what it means. That means that we have rejected what the Lord says about these very important issues in our life. Think about that. This is serious business now. Very serious. Not trying to give you a bummer or a downer. We need to understand where we're at and where we're not. <laughs> the word of the prophets. If you forsake God, God will forsake you. Now what does that look like when we forsake God? Let's look at the turmoil of the land in verses 3 through 6. Now for a long season... Israel had been without the true God, oh my goodness, and without a teaching priest and without the law. But when they were in trouble, they did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought Him. He was found to them. Mercy in the Old Testament people over and over and over in the book of Judges. And in those times there was no peace to them that went out nor to them that came in. But great vexations were upon the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did trouble them with all adversity. The prophet is going back into Israel's history and playing a movie that he wanted Asa and Judah to see, to be reminded of. And what did he want to remind them of? He wanted to remind them this is what happens when you forsake God. Now, they're on the mountaintop right now. Everything's going great. But he wanted to remind them, this is what happens when you forsake God. And what did happen in the days of the judges? In the first two chapters of the judges, it tells us there was a generation who grew up that knew not God nor the things that God did. And then they went a-whoring after other gods. And then every man did what was right in his own eyes. Oh, listen, saints of God. Are you doing what's right in your own eyes? Are you living your life according to God's word and the standard of his word? Are you abiding, yielding, and obeying? Or do you come up with your own standard? Doing what's right in their own eyes. Listen, this is what happens when we forsake God. It says no peace to them who went out and them who came in. No help, no security, no tranquility, no blessed welfare. You don't have the favor of God on your life. So that's terrible. Yes, it is. Great vexations. Your translation may say disturbances. It's defined as confusion, disturbance, destruction, trouble, tumult. The picture is one of severe turmoil. Honey, there's a big difference between a car that's loud and a car that runs over you. <laughs> this was no small disturbance. The whole country was in an uproar. City against city, country against country, people against people, confusion, severe turmoil. Vexed or troubled with all adversity, adversary. Honey, we have an invisible adversary right now that's slaying us. Affliction, anguish, distress, tribulation. All of these stuff, all of these things were happening to the nation of Israel. Why? Because they turned their back on God. No favor, no blessing, no protection. God's just going to let you on your own. Question, Americans, does this look and sound like America? 
Is this that we are experiencing? Is there not some similarity? Is there not some parallel? Is this stuff that we're going through not that? That you are reading right from God's Word written over that several thousand years ago. Huh? Is this not that? Are we not experiencing the consequences of turning our back upon God? The old timers used to say, buddy, you better straighten up because before long your chicken is going to come home to roost. You ever heard that saying? What in the world does that mean? That means that you're going to pay for your poor choices. That means that when you turn your back on God and you rebel against His authority in your life, there may be pleasure in sin for a season, but the payday is coming. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap more than you sow. And you're going to reap later than you sow. And you can deny. You can pretend that it's not going to happen. But if there is a God in heaven. It's going to happen. Because it's the law of the harvest. And we in this country. Have been putting that off. Thinking we can change the law of the harvest. And it's going to be okay. And it, No it's not. It's not. God says it's not. Our chickens are coming home to roost. The consequences of our poor decisions are coming due. How did this happen, folks? This happened to the Lord's people and it's happened to the Lord's people again. How did this happen? Verse 3 has the answer. For a long season... Israel was without, verse 3, a true, the true God, a teaching priest, and the law. Please don't turn me off. I want you to hear what the Spirit of God is trying to say to your heart and my heart this morning. He didn't say that they didn't have a God. He said they didn't have the true God. Right. Yeah. Do you know how many gods they had? They worshipped every form of Baal and every manifestation of Baal that they could. They worshipped every manifestation of Astaroth which has to do with sensuality and sexuality. They worshipped every kind of God that you can think of. But they didn't worship the true and the living God. And how did that happen? Because they were without a teaching priest. Doesn't say that they didn't have any priests. Honey, they had 24 orders of priests. They had priests up to their eyeballs. But they didn't have priests who were teaching the true word of God. And calling them into account. And reminding them that God would require of them. They had a bunch of backslappers. You're okay. It'll be all right. Enjoy yourself. God is such a merciful God. You won't have to really pay for your sins. God didn't really mean that. This country is absolutely full of pastors and preachers and teachers and Bible study leaders that are leading God's people astray. They will not teach them the truth of what God requires of them in their lives. And we just go on in our sin, our habitual sin, acting as if God does not exist. And our chickens are coming home to roost. They were not teaching the law, the Torah which gave them instruction, that gave them direction, that gave them purpose, spiritual purpose in their lives, that put them in a position where God could bless and minister to them and protect them and take care of them. Is this not that? Is this that you see that we are witnessing? Are there not some similarities? Is there not a spiritual parallel? Is God not saying to us, listen, you cannot continue to turn your back 
on me and expect everything to go just wonderful. You say, Pastor, this is so hard. This is so dark. This is so heavy. Yes. That's what sin does in our lives. That's what happens when we rebel against a loving God. You say, is there any hope? Yes. Praise God. There's good news. There is hope. I want you to see the hope of the nation. In verse 8 it says, And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities. And in verse 9, he gathered the people, or in the bottom of verse 8, he restored the altar of the Lord. In verse 9, he gathered all Judah and others together. In verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord with, with all of their heart and with all their soul. And then in verses 15 and 19, the blessing of God came into their lives. They were found by God. God ministered to them. He blessed them. He gave them rest. And they went two decades without war. And at that time, in that season, man, that's all they did is fight. Whoever had the biggest machine gun and the biggest army. Unless you lived under the authority of God. And God fought the battle for you. Amen. Amen. The hope of the nation. Now I want you to get this picture. Here is a man of God, the King Asa, who has brought about all of these spiritual form, reforms in verse or chapter 14. They have just come home from winning the greatest victory of their entire lives in their nation, of the people at that time. A victory. And what does God ask of this guy? Hey, we want you to do more. We want you to get more committed. We want you to take this business really serious. And what did Asa say? Well, I'm going to have to have a little time to think on that. <laughs> well, I need some time to vacation. I've just come back from war. I've been serving you, and I've been doing a whole lot of great things for you. I, I need some time off. <laughs> I need to go down to my beach place <laughs> and cool it there for a while. Or I may go to the mountains to my place there and take it easy there for a while. What do you mean, Lord, you want me to do more? Man, I just wore myself out for you. What would you do if you had served the Lord faithfully? Things were going great and you just won a great victory. And all of a sudden, God put somebody on you with a prophecy and a word that God wanted more out of you. I know what most of us would do. Are you kidding me? But that was not Asa's response, was it? Let me tell you what Asa was, how he responded. He received that word as it truly was. It was the word of the Lord. Somehow he knew it. He knew that God was requiring more of him. He knew that he needed to strengthen himself spiritually. He knew that he had to go on with the Lord. And so he received that word and it says he took courage. He didn't become sarcastic. He didn't say, let me take some time to think about it, Lord. Man, I've got to have some time off here. I've got to, you know, rest up. This is what he said. In verse 8, he took courage. Courage. That word is very interesting in the Hebrew. It means to be bound fast. It means to be attached. To make firm. In other words, he's going to be bound more so to the Lord than he was. It means that he's going to be attached more to the Lord than he was. It means that he's making his commitment to the Lord even further. To strengthen, to support, to persevere, to be valiant, to conquer. Yes! Lord said, we ain't done. We're just getting started. And this man said, yes. After all, what did he just see God do? <laughs> he just saw God dismantle this massive army that had come against him and his people. With 300 chariots to ride them down. 
And God broke them and destroyed them and defeated them right before his eyes. And this man of God said, yes, no place to get off here. We might as well just do it for the glory of God. And he received that word. Woo. He understood that God was asking him to go deeper and to do more or give more. That's what he understood. To go deeper with God. You hear that in your spirits? To go deeper. To go deeper. Now I want you to see what happens when this man committed himself to go deeper with God. This is what kind of hope is out there for us. Listen to this. He removed the idols in verse 8. The abominable idols. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he removed them. Went throughout the land and he removed them. He said, what is an idol? Anything that gets between you and serving God. Right. And worshiping God. Is an idol. You know how many idols we got? <laughs> Oh my goodness. I removed him. He restored the altar of the place of sacrifice so that people could stay right and in proper fellowship with God. He regathered the people. Verse 9. How? Because they saw that God was with him. In verse 12, they renewed the covenant with God. They took an oath and said, we're going to pursue God. We're going to give our heart to Him. We're going to go after Him. We'll give my whole heart and my whole soul to the Lord. And then what is the result of all of this stuff? Verse 15, they rejoiced in the oath that they took. They said, this is a good thing. And they went after God with their whole hearts. And the next thing they knew, God is on them. They're experiencing God in their lives. And what is the last phrase in verse 15? And peace was all about them. <laughs> Honey, if you lived during that time, that's what you wanted is peace all about you. Because there were evil enemies everywhere. They were peace all around them. And then in verse 19, it says that God gave them peace in their land to the 35th year of Asa. That's a marker, by the way. And in verse 10, it said that this started in the 15th year. So how many years is that? Two decades of favor and blessing of God upon their land, living at peace with God and being under His authority and under His blessing. Hallelujah. Does that sound good or what? Mm -hmm. Peace. And there was somebody in his family that thought that they had test his resolve. Mother dearest. She put up one of them nasty, vulgar, asterisk poles. What would her son do? Would he cower before his mother? No, he would not. He was a man of God after God's own heart. He wasn't under his mama's apron strings. Or strings. He wasn't no hen pecked husband or son. He disposed his mother. Just removed her from being queen. He cut down that thing she put up, ground it up, and burned it. Said, Mama, we're going to serve God. Woo! How many people let mama or daddy keep them from serving God today? absolutely sad. Yes, we're to respect our parents. Yes, we are to honor them. But not if they lead us away from serving God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hope in America? Yes. Hope in your life and my life? Yes. But honey, I want to tell you the truth. Please don't get mad at me. Casual Christianity ain't going to get it done. Christianity of convenience ain't going to get it done. What is this weekend all about? It's about people like that right there who came to Plymouth Rock years and years and years ago. What did they understand that we don't seem to understand today? 
that God is calling us to go deeper. Casual Christianity didn't cross that ocean to come over here and start a new life where they could worship God in freedom. You get that? They understood that God was calling them to go deeper. And William Bradford and a hundred other people who were on the main flower landed right there in Plymouth Rock. They thought it the wrong place, but it was the right place because God led them there. Yeah. And you know what they did when they got on that beach? They got on their knees and they thanked the God of heaven and earth for bringing them safely to this country because they were on a mission for God. That's right. They wanted a place where they could raise their families and their children and have a government under the authority of God. Where God was the judge, God was the lawgiver, and God was the king through the people that they elected under the lordship of Christ. They understood. They understood that God was asking them to go deeper. He was requiring more of them. In 1776, 56 people signed the Declaration of Independence over, a little over 150 years later. You know those individuals who signed that, they knew that they were signing their death warrant. And most of them died because they did. But they understood that God was calling them to go deeper. During World War II, we faced the greatest enemy this world has ever seen in Nazi Germany. But the good Christian godly men and women of this country understood that God was calling us to go deeper. And they were willing to give their lives under the authority of God to stop him. And they did. My brothers and sisters, listen to me. Do you think that casual Christianity and convenient Christianity is going to change this? That we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Do you think that casual Christianity. And casual faith. Is going to possess. What God has promised us. At 401 East Moody Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're going to be able. To save your marriage. Do you think you're going to be able. To save your children from the evils of this world. With casual Christianity. No. Mm -hmm. It's going to take more. God is asking us to go deeper. Get ourselves committed to Him so that He can bless, so that He can protect, so that He can lead us by His grace and by His Spirit. Amen? Amen. Listen, we have sold the Lord out for years. This is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You've got to go deeper. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and go deeper. And follow me and go deeper. Right. If we're going to save ourselves, we're going to have to go deeper. Amen. Amen. We've got to get out of the Lord's way so that he can bring about the victory that we need in our lives. You've got to go deeper if you're going to get over your addictions. You're going to have to go deeper if you're going to get over being selfish and self-centered where everything is about you. You've got to give your life to Christ and go deeper. Amen. 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 This is our hope. Jesus Christ is our living hope. And I understand what God's calling for me. Even at my age, I've got to go deeper. That's just the way it is. Less of me and more of him till we reach the place where it's all of him and none of me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. John the Baptist said these words. He, Jesus Christ, must increase and I must decrease. That's the order. Jesus Christ must increase and I must decrease. It's time to go deeper. For his glory. Let's bow before the Lord.